we're going to invest the time into them. The war for talent is huge, as we all know, and it has been, but it's investing in them so they understand why we're doing what we're doing. It's a true investment in our future. And you want to put it in the right hands. From the front lines all the way to the C-suite, the investment of time, energy, and money in the development of leaders is a must if you want your organization to thrive over the long haul. No leader in the organization, including the CEO, is exempt from that responsibility. I'm your host, Tim Spiker, and this is the Be Worth Following podcast, a production of the People Forward Network. On this show, we talk with exceptional leaders, thinkers, and researchers about what actually drives effective leadership across the globe and over time. You just heard from Jim Smith, CEO of Elford Incorporated, a 112-year-old contractor whose construction experience runs the gamut from healthcare to education to retail to multifamily to industrial. The list goes on and on. And you know what else goes on and on? Elford's commitment to developing its leaders. In our conversation, Jim shares how he personally invests in the growth of Elford's leaders. He also talks about his unyielding requirement for fellow executives to disagree with him and how one of his children has impacted Jim so much as a human being that it has made him a more effective leader. But first, let's hear about the leaders who have influenced Jim, including those who took him under their wings in his very first job as a teenage janitor. I've been so blessed with so many interactions with so many people, and not necessarily just interactions, but watching people. My dad was a World War II paratrooper, you know, uh, lifelong uh, UAW machinist type role, you know, the classic 50s, 60s, you know, 70s life after the war. And the dad said, when you go into life, it's important to what you know, but it's more important to who you know. And as he'd said, they would talk about in the wars, you're going to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and people you trust. So I was always on the outlook for people that were smarter than me and always just uh, a sponge for knowledge and for what's out there. And it really hit me when I was uh, in high school, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grow up and all my buddies were going to college and I didn't know if I was going to college or not because, you know, my parents didn't and all. And so I was searching and I went to talk to my school counselor and he looked at me, he knew me from sports and this and that. And he says, Smith, you're not college material. He says, we need to do is find a career for you. And he goes, I got just the thing. He goes, there's a construction company here in town that needs a janitor after school and on Saturdays. And he knew I needed a, a, a job because I was a classic mowing the grass, shoveling the snow kind of thing and putting the money away. So I get this job and the leaders of that organization, they took me under their wing instantaneously. They didn't know anything about me, but they just saw me taking care of their facilities like it was my own, you know, and making money. And so all of a sudden I watched how they just started teaching me about what they were doing. And it was like being on my baseball team. Everybody was around each other and helping one another. And these guys showed this. Now, I didn't know it then, but today I'd call it unconditional love. They really cared about this young kid and wanted to uh, give him some direction. And then on Saturday morning, the CEO of that company was always in the office working. I was like, God, that guy, that guy works hard. These people are fun to be around. They're smart. They're, they're building buildings. And I kind of like this. So they set me off in the direction, you know, to go to college and become a civil engineer. Or so I really learned a lot from those interactions about how to treat people, you know, how they treated me. I was a janitor. I hear this time and time again with the people that we visit with when we talk about kind of their history. What is it that's helped them become who they are? And it still amazes me, but it's I should stop being surprised by it because, okay, I'll, I'll give it away a little bit. Your current age is? 62. 62. So I ask you this question about influential leaders and you immediately go to 18, 17, 18 years old. I was probably 16 when I had my, my first day on the job. So you think about the time span between 16, 17, 18 years old and 62. And would you, I mean, we would have never imagined when you were that age, it's like somebody's going to ask me a question about influential leaders in my life when I'm 62. And these are the people that are going to immediately come to mind. It shaped my way of thinking as I became a professional, as I was put in, you know, roles of leadership. It wasn't that many years separate from that time that I just, 
absorbed how they treated me. And it was classic servant leadership. And I didn't know to call it servant leadership then. I didn't know to call it servant leadership until you bought me the book in 2003. But people can say what they say and do what they want to you, but it's how they make you feel, right? And they made me feel valuable. They, they made me feel that I had a say, that I had a place in the world, that I could do things that were limitless. I had never met a vice president of a company when I was 16. I didn't know what I didn't know, clearly. No 16-year-old does. But I mean, I didn't really understand the impact at the time, what they were having on me, but it was pretty special. Well, and I'm so thankful, knowing the influence and role that you play now, to think about how those leaders are influencing a multitude of lives that you've had a chance to influence through your work at Alfred and the community in different places. It's just that multiplicative effect that happens. I'm going to say when we do it well, but unfortunately, sometimes the opposite is true as well. We multiply when we're treated poorly. But I'm thinking about the position that you were in with, with them. And you're saying they made you feel valued. And how many people that are in a position like you were in are made to feel just the opposite of that? You just just do your job. I don't want to hear from you. You'll hear from me if you don't do it well, and I'll tell you exactly how to breathe and when you're allowed to pee and, <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff. There are many people in your position, probably most, that are treated that way versus the way that you were treated. Oh, absolutely. I think about what you just said about how people are treated, and, and it's because people don't give people the time of day. They don't think they need to. And, and people need us as leaders to interact. In the late 80s, this it was one of our trade partners, big insulation company. I was working for a general contractor then. And you know we'd worked on a few jobs together. And he gave me this book called Operational Excellence. And I'm sure you've read it. But the theme in the book is MWWA, Manage While Walking Around. And it was all stressed on as a leader. You better work hard and know your role, know your product line, know all the steps in the process. If you're a contractor like me, know the plans, know the specs, work hard, knowing that, but spend your days primarily interacting with people and walking around, talking to them about what they're doing, how they're doing it, making sure they've got the resources, making sure they got the support, making sure they know where to go for questions and so on and so forth. And I didn't know it then, but it was about building a culture at work by just reinforcing that you care about all the people that are in your sphere of influence. Too many times we forget about that. If you're in a leadership role, you know, if you think you're the boss, that's fine. But we should think of ourselves as the person that helps influence everybody so that they can execute the work, whatever that work is. I don't, it could be an accounting firm. It could be the back house of a bank, you know, where they're processing credit cards and invoices. It doesn't matter. It's taking time to be with people because you learn so much. I learn more in those interactions and have forever about how we're doing, how they're doing versus me giving advice. There's a perspective that lives behind doing that management while, while walking around. There's a perspective behind that that makes that more effective. And you articulated it. It's basically that people are valuable, that people are worth that time, that people are worth engaging with. Have you ever seen leaders who approached the connection with other people more as a tactical, strategic thing instead of a human-to-human -human interaction thing? I've seen it where, you know, it's kind of like where you go to a seminar and all of a sudden you come back and try to save the world and change everything at once. It's a uh, check in the box, if you will. I, I think really good, authentic leadership. You know, you got to be fanatical about the discipline of how you lead and how you interact with people, how you provide them the right systems, because you got to do all that to get results. Great results, great income is an outcome of being passionate about what you do, having the discipline and, and structure, you know, around and knowing your core competencies and finding and hiring the right people. Let's talk about that for a second. How do you hire the right people? We hired a lot of different levels, a lot of different job titles, if you will. And what we do is we look at what's the profile of that. There's a job description. That's kind of tactical, right? It's pretty set in stone what we want that job to perform. So what we try to create is, is a profile. What's the characteristics of that role? And are, are they aligned with our core values? Are they aligned with our core purpose? Because I think sometimes when 
organizations talk about mission, vision, core values so many times. I don't have a number. I haven't even done the research, but I, I would guess 80 percent of the times people never talk about core purpose and core purpose is why we exist. And our stated core purpose is to make construction a positive experience. And that that's that's experience within the walls of Elford, you know, interdepartmentally. It's with our customers, it's with our design partners, it's with the ability to communicate to the neighbors next to a building that we're building, or the neighbors within a building that we're renovating, or with our building officials, and so on and so forth. We really talk about that a lot with them and ask them to give us examples of how they've had interactions with people and teams and and make it not about them. If we hear I, I, I a lot and not about we, this is how we did it, and this is about what we would do, you know, then we start, can this person shift to we versus I? And most people can, but not everybody can. So that helps us discern, because in our industry, not undifferent than every industry, is, is an ultimate team sport. So if the interviewees and our team, if they don't get that, if they don't get the we portion, then, you know, we're not a match. And um, they might have a great resume, but one of the things with our growth that even becomes more and more and more important, you know, there was a time not too long ago, and I'll say 12 years ago, I pretty much knew every job we were doing. We're five times the company we were 10, 12 years ago. So we've entrusted our brand. We've entrusted our reputation to so many people it's critical that we have the right people. One of the things I love about that purpose is that so many times when people get into the purpose statement business, the purposes sound like it is save the world. And I'm not suggesting that some people aren't genuinely doing that, but so many times when the purpose is save the world or some version of that, the values around that, they're not actually being pursued. It just sounded nice when they were talking about it. They don't actually use it for decision-making, don't actually use it in recruiting. And I think the way you stated that, to make construction a positive experience, it almost is, okay, we're not going to save the world. We're going to make construction a positive experience with us. It's accessible. And I'm like, okay, if it's accessible, then I can show up at work and do something about that. We developed our, our mission, vision, core values in 1994 and... Um... Four years ago, the team came to me and said, hey, Jim, we'd like to revisit all those. And I'm like, oh, might as well take an organ out. That's our soul. And I said, but I can't be in the room. So we had the same. We had probably 35 to 40 people. And they came back and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing. Like the core values and the mission were really the, the same. It was just articulated a little differently, but it was the same message, the same values. And but the only thing that stayed verbatim was that core purpose. And I was like, see, that's how important it is. Because, you know, when a person's you know out on a job site and they're in a cold, dark corner, it's 20 degrees and the wind's blowing or it's 105 degrees, you know, it's like the core value that's aligned. Right? We have six core values. Like you take the one, it says do the right thing. You know, it's the golden rule. So when you're in that cold, dark corner, that sweaty, hot place, or you're just tired and dragging, that's an easy thing for people to remember. Because you don't say, do the right thing. There's no but or and, you know, with it. It's like, do the right thing. And so it's music to my ears as I watch our, our young managers articulating that to our, you know, like college graduates. And it's like, okay, it's happening. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's creating a language in your organization. It's not just throwing words out there, but it's identifying people who exemplify those actions and telling them stories and we got competitors that build buildings and they build them well. Those two things alone are about the journey. You know, it's about the experience. It's about the culture on a job. And uh, people say, well, you don't need culture on a construction job. <laughs> you need it more there than anywhere. I mean, you got a workplace that changes every single day. Every day it changes. Like, we know culture changes, right? All the time. It changes whether you like it or not. But I'm really proud of our team. And uh, when I look at Culture 2.0 in this organization, a couple years ago, it came with an idea that we wanted to pilot a program where by job, we would create a mission statement with the owner, with our customer and with our design team and with our key trade partners on a job. So again, it gives 
the trade partners to a heightened realization of the impact they're making when they're in that cold, dark corner, or that hot seat, you know, or they're making electrical shutdown in the NICU and they got the most fragile of our population are laying there and you're making a switch over. So helping them, empowering them with the significance of what they do. It's been the coolest thing and customers love it. We love it. Trade partners love it. And you got to care to love it. But, you know, that's how we pick our teammates, you know, people that care. Because you and I have gotten to know each other really well over a relatively uh, longer period of time, I know a little bit about your family. And you've got some uniqueness in your family that from my estimation has impacted the way that you think and the way that you lead. And so I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. So we have two sets of twins, boy and girl in each set. The first set was born when we were 24. We were surprised. And then all of a sudden, two years later, Cindy's pregnant again. We're like, oh, by the way, you're having twins again. So when she was 22 weeks pregnant, they found something on the ultrasound. The, 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 the OB said one, one of the babies is not thriving. I'm like, you know, what does that mean? And uh, he goes, I'm not sure. And I mean, the technology there then to determine what that meant, obviously did, it exists more today. So anyway, that, that day forever changed our lives, not knowing what it meant. And uh, fast forward for the next 13 weeks, there was a lot of uncertainty in our lives. And then Missy and Ben were born and they rushed Ben off to the NICU and and uh, he was a little dude. He was just a hair under three pounds and she was fine. So that night was, it was a rough night. And I had gone home because, you know, the other kids were at home and, uh, you know, no cell phones. You know, I get home and uh, the godmother, the one of the younger babies, she's bawling and crying really hard. I'm like, what happened? You know, what's going on? She goes, Cindy's on the phone. And she was really upset because he had just come into her bedside and said, your son has Edwards disease and he's not going to live nine months. And I'm thinking, why did he do that with her alone in the middle of the night? <laughs> you know, and so you don't, the luxury of having a cell phone is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I bolt down there and I demanded for him to come back into our room. I said, because you don't, you don't do that to our family without a little support from my wife. And he came back in and he goes, well, son, your child has Edwards disease and he's, he's barely going to make nine months. I said, how do you know? I, how do you know this? And he says, I just know just the way his ears are turned. I said, that doesn't make any sense. I said, we all have DNA. And I'm this engineer, you know, geek going, you got to give me more than his ears are turned, you know? And at the same time, sitting there, both ball and we go down the NICU and, uh, you know, I'll never forget that first visual. He's a little red dude, got wires all over him. It was horrible. And, um, he stayed in that NICU for five to six weeks and I'd go visit him every week. And what I noticed in that visit, I go there like at four in the morning before I, on the job site at six and, and she would go later in the day. And what I noticed in that room, he was far much better off than 90% of those babies in that NICU. I was like, okay, so I don't know what's going on, but Ben's got a leg up. We just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. It took like eight weeks to get the DNA analysis. And it was a, a, a thing they call trisomy eight and deletion eight, eighth chromosome deficiency. And of course, the first thing an engineer says, well, don't they offset each other? It's like, you know, this is an equation. There's two sides of the equation. Of course, she goes, son, no, that's not the way it works. So so she proceeded to show us because they've never, they, they could never find a case where both chromosomes existed in one body. And so she showed us pictures and everything of both chromosomes. They were just God awful. I mean, they were awful. And I said, fine, you know, I'm going to go find somebody who understands this. So, you know, of course, no internet. So Cindy goes, you know what? You do what you got to do. I'm taking him home and we're going to love him. And he's healthy. Otherwise, you know, there, was, there wasn't anything wrong with him, if you will, health wise. I mean, he had a chromosome deficiency. And I said, that's great, honey. You take him home and love him. I'm going to go find a fix. <laughs> of course, what a silly thing to say. You don't fix chromosome deficiencies. But she was smart enough to know that we both were somewhat grieving. And she knew how to handle it herself and what was best for our family. And she knew what I needed to do to process it. So it, it took about nine months for me to work through my engineer research syndrome and 
and buy into the power of love. And Ben's had a number of challenges throughout the year, but we've met incredible angels along the way, mostly in the caregiving field, mostly in the therapy field, mostly in the service field who want to support you, not try to fix something. And you're in trouble for asking me this question because it takes about four days to truly answer the question. <laughs> but Ben's thriving today. Ben's in the day program with Goodwill, and I could tell you a million stories, but he's thriving today. He lives with us. He's a small guy. He's only 48 inches tall and 65 pounds. But you know, Ben can't add two and two, and he can't count money. But Ben, Ben knows. He reads how people feel. He can engage in conversation somewhat. He knows and follows about every sport on the planet. And uh, he gets it in his own way. And he's fun to be around. He makes people smile, make people laugh. But what Ben did more than anything, and he's touched thousands of people, that he showed that people with disabilities are approachable. He has taught, without teaching, so many people through his life, and still does today, that you, know, you can make a difference in a life for someone who has a disability and, and be really important to them. And plus you grow as a person because now you understand what they're going through. And he expresses love better than most people that I've met. You know? And I think it's the power of love, not in a romantic way. You know what I mean? We care about each other and it's amazing watching him care about people. <laughs> you know, and he's made me... Yeah, a better father, a better grandfather, better leader, better husband, better friend. He's made me a more patient person. He's made me a more intentional person. People would say early on, I'm sorry. I'm like, I get it. You don't have to say you're sorry. I'm thrilled. I can't imagine life without Ben. What would you say is the biggest shift if you look at kind of how you looked at whether it be life or leading other people or interacting relationships, any of those kinds of things. What is the biggest shift from pre-Ben to today? So I would say being able to take a, a worldview of people, of individuals and in, in situations and environments and not make snap decisions. Sometimes you got to make snap decisions as a leader. Sometimes he's taught me to think things through and he's helped me to think about it through. Cause we had to think for Ben. He didn't walk till he was nine and he barely talked till he was, we did a lot of sign language early on. You know, I talked to our leaders today about put yourself in their shoes. Think like our customer, think like our trade partners, think like our design partners. Um, he made me think that way. I think, I don't know that I would have gotten there as quickly as I did if it hadn't been for Ben. So yeah, we've been blessed. Was it hard? It was hard. It was hard at times, you know, And but we had a lot of faith in God that he gave us Ben for a reason. And Cindy deserves the credit that we had the courage to, to do what we did, how we did it. And she led that. I've just had a sense for a very long time that Ben being a part of your family plays a really big role in who you are. And getting a chance to be around you and watch just the way you interact with people, the way you talk, the way you think, there's a, maybe it's the word patience that you said, maybe it's the word grace that comes to mind, but you think about kind of hard charging leaders who are driving for important things. And you are that, but you do it with a humanity that I don't see with a lot of other people. And yeah, you might've gotten there eventually on your own without Ben being part of your family, but I have a, fa I have a feeling that Ben was an accelerant <laughs> and an enabler to that. Yeah. So, you know, I also have that tough love component that he gave me. I was like, don't tell me you can't do that. <laughs> you want to, you want to, you want to, you want to hear something somebody overcame? Let me tell you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't want to hear your excuses. <laughs> well, let's, yeah. let's buckle up, lace up, let's go, you know, come on. Don't give me a bunch of weak excuses. That's good. Well, hey, look, when you care about people, you can deliver that message effectively. When you don't care about people and you deliver that message, it ultimately is not very effective. And those people are trying to find employees these days. <laughs> You're preaching then. You talked about leadership development. You mentioned it a little bit previously. I know that you have been intentional and diligent. Talk a little bit about the leadership development process 
within Elford and what you guys have, pardon the pun, constructed <laughs> over over the years around developing your leaders? I'll tell you what started our leadership development program internally, especially. It's been probably 18 years ago. We started a very structured mentoring program and it's thriving today. And it's ebbed and flowed through the years, but our young mentees, you know, they don't have to be young. It can be they can be 40 years old. It doesn't matter, but they have to apply for it. They have to submit you know, essentially an application of why, why they should be in the program. And so they, you know, they get a mentor. And today it's a two-year program. And they also have a peer mentor who helps them navigate the process. And it's, it's mentee-driven, which means a person being mentored has to develop the topics, has to develop the subject matter by which each session is held. And they're meant to have a, a, a one to two hour session monthly. And if you show up with a blank sheet of paper, that's a problem <laughs> because you've got to respect your mentor's time and you have to come with questions about what do you want to learn? Where do you want to go? The mentors will take it anywhere you need them to go. Mentors have the freedom of bringing other experts within our company into those sessions too. If say if a young PM needs a little more understanding of how do I read a subcontractor's pre-qual sheet? Because he gave me a balance sheet. And I have no clue how to read a balance sheet. So we'll bring the CFO in or a controller in and they'll, they'll help with that. So it does two things. One, it, does, it, it allows them to learn how to read that financial statement, but also it kind of creates a relationship building environment between that PM who probably has never been in the CFO's office yet. It creates an environment of what an open door feels like in this organization. And, and we have what we call mingle with the masters for the mentees. And during a year, there's nine of those. So we'll have all kinds of specialized classes with them as a group. How does somebody end up becoming a mentor in the organization? What's the process for, for qualifying people to say, okay, we're willing to hand our up and comers to you, trusting what you're going to share with them? So today we look for our, VP, our executive VP of talent, our COO, our president to scan the team and say, okay, who's ready for that? And honestly, Tim, to be selected as mentors, a part of many of these mentors now, part of their development plan, you know, because they might've just become a director of a group. And so a part of their leadership responsibilities now is how to be mentoring all day long, going back to that management while walking around. Because, you know, all great doers don't make great leaders, right? We all know that. And so this is a way to help them either reach that or not. And so it's a great way for us to just put them to the test, if you will. And we have to create that field that they can plant themselves in and grow. What do you see as your primary role in it or overseeing it at this point? Yeah. So I don't directly oversee it today. I participate in like the kickoff meeting and talk about the importance of it and give them a historical perspective. And I talk about accountability on their part. And it also lets me be able to drop in with them and just ask them throughout the year, how's it going? Talk to me about your experience. And my role has evolved. So I've taken on like the next level of all-stars in our company that have been through all these programs. And now I'm doing one-on-one, -on -one. you can call it mentoring or coaching, whatever you want to call it. But I've got about a dozen young men and women that I meet with for an hour a month. These are players that we see in our seats in 10 to 15 to 20 years, you know? And so we're going to invest the time into them. The war for talent is huge, as we all know, and it has been, but it's investing in them so they understand why we're doing what we're doing. We talk about the why a lot. And every one of those meetings is, is different. That's the cool thing. It's really engaging. I think there's a lot of CEOs, a lot of presidents would say, okay, just hold on. I mean, this is a chunk of your time. This is a chunk of your energy. I can't give that kind of time to development. What would you say to somebody who has a pushback on the amount of investment that, that you're currently making in developing the leaders in your organization? It's a true investment in our future. People my age would complain about millennials and say, God, they expect a lot. They're always asking why, why, why. I said, <laughs> I took the view. like, you know what? They're making me rethink about a lot of the things we do. 
you know, and, and they taught me to ask the why. Early in my career, I just was given orders and say, you do this as I say, and boom, you know, you did it. And the, they, they taught me to step back, if you will, and ask the why. Why are we doing it this way? Why are we doing it that way? And if we don't invest, we can't trust outside organizations completely to teach our young leaders of how to lead our company. We should know more than anybody of how we, we see our company launching forward. And you want to put it in the right hands. And I don't know how you afford not to. And of course, one of my other favorite books was Built to Last. And, you know, they talk about building a sustainable organization. And if you want to build a sustainable organization, you want the majority of your talent to come up through your organization. Not everybody. It's always great to have somebody from the outside. It's always great to have some fresh perspective, someone who's not breathing our air all the time, you know, as they say. So, but it works. It's worked here. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we could define it works. It could be looking at like at the longevity of people being there. It could be looking at what it feels like to be here. And it could look like the top and bottom line growth that you've experienced in a, in what is traditionally an incredibly competitive and difficult industry to be successful in. I think by any of those measures that Elford would be deemed as successful. So pick one, <laughs> pick any of them. Let's talk about your executive team a little bit um, because you've been very intentional, more so than most organizations that I've had the opportunity to observe about how you're building this executive team. And you've landed in a spot now where it sounds to me like you're reaping some of the fruit of being very diligent every year. So talk a little bit about whether it be strategically or philosophically about your perspective on building your executive team. You know, I became CEO about 12 years ago and I've been president for 10 years prior to that. And it wasn't one magical moment, but it was a series of meetings with our leadership team. I found out that every time I was talking about a new idea or thinking about a new adventure, or new business line, it was, Jim, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. No one said, no, no, no. I really have a major question about that, Jim. That doesn't fit. That's not going to work. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? I'm going home thinking, that's pretty scary. I can't be the smartest guy in the room. And I said, because they weren't willing to take risks. They weren't willing to challenge me. I'm about as approachable and challengeable as it, as it comes. And, and I'll change. You know what I mean? It's And I was like, oh. This doesn't feel good. You know, everybody's getting along. They're all good people, but no one was challenging me. So we systematically just either found new roles for those leaders, or we just said, we're going to part ways and because they weren't willing to grow. And we had growth plans and an organization can't build itself around people. It's got to build itself around strategy, goals, and aspirations. When you say you can't build around people, you mean like around a particular person's personality, that particular individual. Yeah. Or that person's capabilities or that, that person's aspirations. Okay. Yeah. The whole has got to be more meaningful and bigger than just one person's capabilities. Absolutely. And there's a great book called The Next Level, and it essentially is an S curve. And it talks about the evolution of a company. And, you know, at the bottom of the S is it's the entrepreneurial stage. And, you know, everybody's wearing different hats and everybody's sleeping like on cots under their desk. And, you know, it's like working 20 hours a day. And then as you go up that S, departments, processes, procedures, systems, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's kind of like the flywheel and good to great. You hit that where you feel things are clicking and then you've got a choice to make. If you look at the top of an S, it, it curls back down. So your decision then is do how long is that S tail go or do I want to reinvent ourselves? And as I introduced myself to a lot of people today, I said, we're Alfred's 112 year old startup. So it's like you pile S's on each other and they can be months or years. So we said, we got to get to the next level and we need new entrepreneurs to drive this. And so we systematically figured out what, what talent we needed and what seats and, you know, they came from outside the organization. And even in the last three years, two of our leaders have retired and we had, we had a beautiful succession planning process in place for our CFO and our director of HR. And it's like we haven't missed a beat. Now, there's a lot of work put into that, but that was part of that. Okay, now we're going up the spine of that S again. 
and we're ready to hit a flywheel here soon. And then we'll say, okay, what's next? And what what's next for us is we open an office in Charlotte. And I'm sure some of the founders of our company are going, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> But it was our responsibility to create that next S. So you're essentially saying that in many ways, one of your primary qualifiers for people that you wanted to be a part of your executive team are people that would challenge you, not people that would agree with you. Absolutely. And Mike Fitzpatrick is our president. And so one of the things we work really hard on is our succession planning, and it's very purposeful. So Mike came on board 11 years ago now, maybe 12. So Mike is the owner and principal of Alfred Development, a sister company. And there's firewalls between our company. Mike, Mike's a brilliant guy. He's not a civil engineer or construction manager. He's a finance major. He's a developer, but he clearly knows the business and he knows customers and he's great with people. He's a fantastic team builder. And Mike was the perfect first person, first change on the executive leadership team because Mike challenged me on almost you know 80% of the thing. It was great. You know, I told him one day, I said, you have to challenge me on everything. He goes, yeah, I do. <laughs> You can you can back it off just a little bit. It's okay. It's now, okay. I can use we, a break I, once. We in a did while. have some fun with that, but it was the greatest thing for everybody else to see. But when they saw Mike challenge me, he had his own ideas. It's one thing to challenge somebody. That's kind of easy. But to bring a solution means you're working a little harder and you're thinking and you care about the future. You care about the team. So that clearly was one the beginning of saying who's in the boat and who's not. Because if you're going to be in the boat, you got to exhibit that leadership characteristic. I mean, it's in a professional way too. And most of those challenges weren't like around the table with 10 or 12 people. You know, Mike was coming in with new ideas and we'd say, go to that next meeting. And I'd say, Mike, why don't you leave? You know, he would know ahead of time, but Mike's going to lead the meeting here today. And it was like, oh, okay. Mike's president now. So that's, yeah, okay. We're, uh, we're listening to Mike. And it's also as the leader being comfortable in your skin to delegate leadership to others too, you know, so that there isn't that point, you know, there's multiple points of leadership and the consistency. Cause you know, there isn't anything more important for an organization is the alignment of the executive team. If executive team, leadership teams, whatever your organization calls it, if they're not aligned, it is so obvious and so transparent and it takes work. It takes the right people. Obviously, COVID has had an impact, not just on on the United States, but around the world. And we have this massive movement that's happening in the workplace where people are moving from one job to another and saying no to things that they previously had said yes to for 20 years. But you said it earlier, the war for talent has always been going on. And and now we have something even more on top of that. How is that affecting Alfred these days? The great resignation, you know, the media hasn't done any of us any favors by you know, how, how, how this has exploded in the headlines. However, you know, it's one of those things you can't change that. So I'm going to worry about it. It has impacted us. It's been interesting. We've had people leave to say their parents were in Florida. And their, they had a sister in Virginia and they had a brother in Texas. And they said, you know, we need to all be together. And we've seen three or four cases of that. We've seen people leave to pursue things outside our industry. You can't control that. Those things, no matter what we do, no matter what we pay, isn't going to impact those decisions. We stepped back, say, a year ago and just re-looked at all our benefits, too, and said, what else could we offer? What else could we provide for our team that would be appealing? There's many things we can't help them with. Child care has been the biggest disruptor. For everybody, we stepped back and looked at our uh, maternity and paternity leave. They needed a boost. And we have a huge Women Builders of Alfred group. We have a tremendous amount of females in our organization that are builders, not just in accounting or marketing, but are part of operations. I'm really proud of our Women Builders of Alfred. I'm actually, when they meet monthly, I go to every one of their meetings and I spend about five to 10 minutes just being there for questions and just talking about what's going on. and. Now I look forward to it because there's so much energy in that room. So we've upgraded our development programs. You know, we created a new development program for all our foreman and superintendent. So we've got them in a program that talks about 21st century leaderships, about 
building a culture on a job site, courageous conversations, developing deliverable action plans. We've enhanced, like I said, the mentoring program and the leaders are more intentional about being in front of our team out in the field, being intentional about team activities with departments and making sure they're taking time to do things together and having the flexibility to do things together socially. So what, what I'm hearing you say is you guys have made some adjustments because, but in some cases it forced you to look at things that maybe you would have said in retrospect, we probably should have been looking at that anyway. Absolutely. Have you had a moment where you've had a mass shift, people leaving Elford that just left you in a, in a lurch in the midst of this, you know, increased war for talent? We haven't. We've not. There's been no like that floodgate opened or anything. As I asked this question with all the people that we're visiting with and others outside of the podcast, I'm hearing a lot of the same things. We visit with only a kind of certain kind of leader in a certain kind of organization because we're not trying to promote that other stuff. And I think if I were to just take the small sample set of the people that we visit with, the great resignation is not so great because they've built organizations and leaders that people will be like, look, I get to, I get paid to be here. To your point around, you know, there are family things, or maybe I had the aspiration that I always wanted to be a X Games motocross. Like, there's that kind of stuff that COVID has brought out, like life's too short, life's too long, whichever it is, I'm going to go do this. Or I need to be in my family. There's the other exodus, which is I hate this job and I hate these people <laughs> and I don't want to come here to work here anymore. And that kind of stuff I'm finding time and again with the people that we filter through to have a part of this discussion is they're not experiencing what is being reported on the news. And I think it's a testament to you and what others have done. You've readied yourself for this moment for the last couple of decades. We really learned that in the last crisis, you know, the financial recession, we learned how, how do we best prepare ourselves for this happening again? We didn't know what it was going to be. So how do you build a stronger more culturally centered organization with great systems, great leadership, great hiring practice, great benefits, and on and on and on. There's a lot of slices to that pie that have to work to make it a great pie. And now organizations like Elford and others are experiencing benefits in many cases, even thriving in the midst of a time when so many others are trying to figure out how to survive. So it feels like a very filtering time. Well, and you know, what's the beauty of it is that when you have that environment, majority of people come and talk to you if they're not feeling good about something. You won't be afraid to walk into your office Monday morning with that envelope sitting on your chair <laughs> or, or so-and-so walks in my office and shuts the door and you're, okay, I got, I know what's coming now. Customer centricity is kind of a uh, a buzzword that a lot of people will use customer care, getting to know your customer, voice of the customer, all that kind of stuff kind of lands into a, a similar bucket. How does Alfred approach that? I think you've heard me use the word care a lot. And similar to invest in our time into our teammates, more than ever, do we have to invest time with our customer outside of what I would call regular meetings because they're running a business. They've got a lot of challenges. They've got a lot of risk. They've got the same risk and challenges we do run in our business. And oh, by the way, they're building a building or renovating their building, and that's not their core purpose. So especially the leadership team, we're spending a lot more time over the last two years intentionally finding time, making time to make sure we have our customers' ears one-on-one. -on -one. You know, and generally it's a it's a structured half hour call and every customer is different. Every customer has different needs and every customer not want it, might not want it once a month. You just have to gauge them and get to know them as people. And you become their friend, not just their business partner. And so you want them to open up and help them walk through this journey, be a part of it because they're under a lot of pressure to do their own business. And that's been really key for us in solidifying our existing relationships and helping us build new relationships. There are some other things before we wrap up here that I want to point out regarding what Jim had to share with us. One is a little bit subtle, but I think worth mentioning. Did you notice how many times during our discussion that Jim referenced the books that he was reading? 
Some of you may have heard the phrase, leaders are readers. But one thing that we know, whether it's through reading a book or watching a TED Talk or listening to a podcast, is that we as leaders need to be in continuous learning mode. And Jim certainly exemplified that that has influenced the way he leads and the way he thinks. So let's take a cue from him on that. Secondly, it really got my attention that Jim took such umbrage at having yes people on his executive team that when he wasn't getting enough pushback, that he actually concluded that he needed to change some members of his executive team. And so I just ask us rhetorically, do we have yes men and yes women around us as leaders? And are we tolerating that? Or are we working in opposition to that? A fun little exercise that you can do around that is to take a $20 bill, a $50 bill, and a $100 bill and put it in your pocket before you go to your next executive meeting. If you're leading that meeting and somebody kind of sort of hints at challenging you, pull the $20 bill out, give it to them and tell them why. If they step a little further into that space, then go with the 50. And if they really come at you, now still in a respectful way, but if they really say, hey, I have some grave concerns about the idea that you just shared there, boss, give them the $100 bill. You'll create some smiles in the room, but you will also make a point. Now, here's the reality that comes before putting any dollars in your pocket, and that is, do we have the humility and the personal sense of security to have people challenge our ideas? That comes before we try to do any cute and fun things like handing out dollars in meetings. But if you're there on the humility and the personal security, then you can take some fun actions like that to help emphasize with people that you want people who will challenge you. And you may get to a spot like Jim communicated where he realized he didn't have the people who were willing to challenge him. And in order to lead the company appropriately, he had to switch out those leaders. Finally, Did you notice how much time that Jim is using to invest in the leaders that report to him? There's a big chunk of time, 10 to 15 hours per month, individual one-on-one. And let me emphasize the difference between a get stuff done conversation and a leadership development conversation. The get stuff done conversation is regarding your three major projects, where are you at with regard to schedule and budget? That's a get stuff done conversation. We have to have those with the leaders that we're leading all the time, but that's not the type of conversation that Jim was referring to. He was referring to a conversation that's about how well that person is leading. So, for example, to sit down with the people that you're responsible for and say, talk to me about where you're seeing yourself over the last 30 days in terms of being successful as a leader And tell me where you see yourself not being as successful, maybe even some spots where you're failing. And let's talk about what's going on there and what we can do to improve that. Here's another question that falls into the more of the leadership development category, which is to say to those folks, walk me through the leaders on your team that you're investing in. Where does each one of them need to grow and develop as a leader? Let's talk about each one of them and the improvements they need to make and what's your plan to help them take those steps and make that progress. Do you see the difference between those conversations and the get stuff done conversations? There is a big difference. And notice that Jim is putting a lot of time and energy into the leaders that report to him so that he can help them become the future of the organization, the future leaders of the organization. In that time, he's not working in the business. And frankly, he's not even working on the business. In that time, he's investing in the future of the business. So that's the final question I want to leave you with today. When you look at how you're spending your time as a leader, do you have meaningful time where you are investing in the leadership development of the leaders who report to you? I'm Tim Spiker, reminding you to be worth following and to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. If you've heard something valuable today, please share our podcast with your colleagues and friends. And if you're up for it, leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening.